This week we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion. So if you have not gotten that diversity credit yet, you are in luck because Kristen Prince of Prince Law Firm is here to talk to you about uh, how to have diversity and inclusion in your firm. Kristen is an employment lawyer and she, oh, where's my sentence? She likes to bring turn adversity into opportunity for her clients. So a couple of housekeeping notes. We, if you haven't gotten the handout yet, there is a link in this webinar that you can download to your computer. You should find a tab that says files. And when you click on it, uh, it will automatically download. Also, there's a chat box to the right. You are encouraged to use it uh, to talk about anything you like to share that's relevant to the webinar or also ask your questions. We will take questions during the presentation. That's not a problem at all. I think that it also um, enhances the webinar for everybody. So please do, and I encourage you to use it. Um, finally, just one shout out to our sponsor, Messenia Advisors. Messenia is a small business accounting practice that likes to serve professionals like us. And they have been delivering um, these webinars in the last six weeks. So, Messenia Advisors, you can find them online at messeniaadvisors.com. So with that, I'm going to bring Kristen up so that she can start her program. All right, so can you see us? We see you. Yes, okay. Thank you for having me and hopefully it can be interactive. If at any point, if you have any comments or questions, please enter them in chat because it does make it more entertaining for me and hopefully for you as well. Uh, this is a topic that actually everybody in my office really loves. We, in addition to um, counseling executives and professionals and uh, businesses on employment matters, we do have a training uh, part of our firm and we do focus a lot on workplace culture. So this is something, I mean, personally I've worked in some bad cultures. So, um, you know, to be able to help businesses create a good culture is really fulfilling for me. Okay, so, um, hold on one second, diversity and inclusion. The most important part of diversity and inclusion is really the in my mind, fostering the inclusive workplace because you can have diversity, but if people don't feel engaged and included and heard in the workspace, it's really not going to be a good culture. I mean, just having diversity in and of itself is, is not enough. Um, so a little bit about our background. We have a team of litigators, but a lot of what we're doing is counseling too and training as well. So the main things I think that are important for diversity and inclusion is first, just even understanding why there's an ethical case and also a business case for having a diversity and inclusion initiative. Um, a big part of really creating an inclusive culture is acknowledging biases. We all have them. And I think a lot of times we want to pretend that we don't have them, uh, but it's really important to kind of do a little self-assessment and see where are blind spots, what are our biases. And this is especially important in hiring and retention. It's interesting because I have a lot of friends who are business owners and even friends who have law firms. Um, and I'm always asking, how do you ensure that you don't have bias either in your hiring or in your compensation, in your bonus structure? Because it is really hard not to not to have these ideas of, oh, well, I like that person, they're like me, they do things in the same way as me. Um, so hopefully I give you some ideas on how you can remove some of those biases and make sure that you're really having a, um, a system in place that at least minimizes the impact of biases. Um, then creating an inclusive workplace culture. I, there are some things that companies are doing really well, um, but Kind of like law, it, I think diversity and inclusion is one of those areas where there's a ton of ways to do it wrong and it's a lot easier to see when it's wrong. 
it's a little bit harder. There's no absolute right way. Um, and so hopefully I give you some ideas that you can implement. And then, like I said, hopefully you have some questions along the way as well. So starting out with the ethical and business case for diversity, why is it important? Um, you know, people have different ideas of what diversity is. And I think um, it's pretty obvious to most people that diversity includes gender and national origin and race and religion. But it's also about diversity of abilities, diversity skill set, um, and diversity of background. So, you know, how did somebody grow up? Where did they grow up? Did they, what part of the country or did they grow up outside of the country? All of those things can, can um, impact the level of diversity. And so there are specific things right now, I think where we want to see more diversity in gender and race. But also let's not forget about making sure that we're, we're not just hiring everybody from the same background. Um, and then why, why is it important? I mean, I always say you can be a jerk and be successful, uh, but we spend a lot of time at work. I mean, if you work even just a full time, 40 hour a week job, you're probably spending more time at work than you are with your family, with your friends, with anybody else that's important to you. And so to be part of an environment where everybody feels accepted and valued, I hope is important. It's certainly important to me. I don't want to come into work and feel like I don't like any of these people and I don't feel like they understand me. I don't feel heard by them. I don't feel valued by them. Uh, but then the business side is generally speaking, when people do feel engaged, when they do feel included in the work, in the workspace, when they do feel valued, they're more likely to stick around. They're more likely to work harder and have a greater productivity. <coughs> and there's been a lot of research. I'm sure many of you have read it, uh, not just by Forbes, but McKinsey has put out a bunch of studies about how uh, companies that have more diversity, they've done things specifically on gender diversity and race diversity, have better economic performance. So um, if for gender, they say by 15%, who, with, where there's ethnic diversity, it's up to 35% outperformance of less diverse workplaces. So if it helps you make more money and that's your primary driver, I mean, you know, this is a way to do that. Uh, they also talk about just over top line revenue. There's a bunch of studies about this. Um, and mostly innovation and creativity. I know in my office, and I mean, we work in an environment, if you work in law, you don't have that many black and white yes or no answers. If we did, probably the internet could do our job without any help. Um, so there, you need to have creativity. You need to have people come from a different perspective and challenge each other. Uh, that's part of the inclusion is being able to challenge each other. But the but people of a different background are more likely to see things from a different perspective. So this acknowledging bias, there's a lot of talk about implicit bias, implicit bias training, um, and you see some of that. In fact, I participated in a number of them, and I'm always surprised when people who are participants at the end say, wow, I never thought I had any biases, because, I mean, we all have biases. They're ingrained in them. They're fed to us by the, our TVs. Um, I can think of even when my oldest daughter was three years old and I brought her home this book of women superheroes or girls superheroes. And she was like, well, oh mom, girls aren't superheroes uh, because they're fed these kinds of stories from the beginning. So of course I told her women have the only true superpower because they can create life, but um, <laughs> that's just my personal response to it. Uh, but biases aren't always negative. They can be positive. You can have a bias. There's uh, biases that a certain group of people might be smarter or might be better at science or better at math. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that show that girls 
once they get to like second grade, start believing this idea that, oh, boys are better at math and science and girls are better at these soft skills. So it's not necessarily always a negative bias. So there's things out there called like the horn halo effect where there's certain biases that are negative or certain biases that say this person is wonderful and anybody who looks like this has to be a wonderful person or anybody who looks like that has to be a bad person. We see that a lot in the media, again, on TV. Um, another form of bias you might hear a lot about is obviously gender bias, which I talked about. Name bias. Um, a lot of companies are removing review of the names on resumes because there is a strong bias about certain names. Um, I, I believe there's a statistics like that there's more um, men named Steve that are CEOs than, than there are women CEOs. So be, there's this idea that if you have one of these more common male names, you're going to get preferential treatment. Um, similarity affinity bias is when you like somebody because they seem like you, either they look like you or they're into the same, you know, you're both into golf or you're both into pink frisbee or whatever it is, but there's this, oh, that person must be good because they like the same things as me. Uh, so, and being conscious, kind of looking in the mirror and questioning yourself about those things is really critical. Um, so there's, I'm going to tell a story and I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I should have actually put this in a poll, but I didn't. Um, so I was thinking about a conversation I had with my doctor uh, this morning while I was driving to work. And while I was driving, I almost got in an accident. I slammed on my brakes to avoid a collision because the person who was driving in front of me was just incompetent, cutting across lanes and uh, then like driving too slow and then too fast. Um, and while all of this was going on, I was trying to drop my screaming child off at, at uh, the nannies. It was just a really hectic morning, okay? So take a step back and think about that. When you, when I'm telling the story, who did you visualize was the doctor? Is the doctor a man or a woman? What about the driver? Who did you visualize as the driver? Uh, oftentimes people will visualize that the driver is a woman and maybe even have um, like an ethnic or uh, national origin that is part of your bias. Um, and who is the nanny? Do I have a male nanny? Do I have a female nanny? All of those ideas that pop in your head about who fits into those roles are part of our, our uh, biases. Um, so if you did imagine that the doctor was a man and the driver who was incompetent was a woman and that the nanny was a woman, uh, maybe you're starting to see that you also have some implicit biases. One thing you can do, especially if you manage people or even if you have kids and you want to be more conscious of this as well, is you can take one of the implicit association tests. Literally, you can Google it and you can find um, multiple versions of it. And it will talk, it will display and reveal some biases that you might not even believe that you have. Also, I always say if you're going to manage people, learn more about biases because I, I personally am always surprised how my biases influence my management in ways that I would have said no way that's not even possible or that influence um, even just advice that I'm giving to clients. So being really conscious of your biases and also the, the person who you're talking to and the biases that they have as well. Uh, and test yourself, you know, we get out of your comfort zone, expose yourself, really take a look um, at your at your office, at your who you surround yourself with, your neighborhood, all of that. You know, my team is a very diverse team, but then I had a friend challenge me on the diversity about saying, oh yeah, it's diverse, but you don't have, I mean, we're a small office, so we're not gonna have 
you know, somebody from every single country or every background or every religion, but being conscious of maybe where our blind spots are is important. Hiring and retention. Um, it's a hard one because especially in a small office, you want to be around people that you like. And if your biases are such that you like people who are like you, it gets, uh, it's difficult to really challenge yourself to remove um, the biases and remove and really focus on diversity. So one way to do it is to consider having diversity goals, meaning, you know, is, is your firm all male? Is it all female? Is it, is there some place where you could maybe add a different perspective and you can really focus on not necessarily saying, Oh, I'm only going to hire this person, but really give a, uh, Cast a wider net in terms of candidates that you're looking at. Don't just email your friends and ask them for recommendations. Ask people who are maybe outside your normal world. You know, there's a lot of affinity bar associations. You can reach out and say, I'm really trying to build a more diverse office and I would like to open this up and see if I can get applicants from um, one of these more, one of these affinity bar associations use a blind resume process so this can be hard if you're the only person and you're the hiring manager and people are just sending you the, their resume but you could ask people to um in their ad you could say submit your resume provide your email uh please don't provide your name don't provide any identifying information so or there's actually a number of services that you could use that allow candidates to upload their resume and they'll de-identify the information for you. Um, this is something that we do. We use sample work, sample tests. So for like, for example, for an administrative position, we might have a more challenging application process in part because we want to make sure the person is really reading directions and following directions. Um, we want to limit the number of applicants because it's horrible when you get hundreds of resumes and people aren't qualified. So it really narrows down the eligible candidates if you have a specific process that's very detailed and is essentially a work sample test. You can also do that with, uh, with lawyers. Oftentimes what we do is we ask somebody to draft a demand letter. We'll give them a set of key facts and we wanna see what their interpretation would be and how they're gonna present those issues. So those are some examples. I mean, I'm happy if anybody wants to reach out to me separately to give ideas that are more specific to your practice area. But I'm sure that you know the things that you have to do on a regular basis. And so to give somebody a test where you're really looking at the quality of their work instead of identifying characteristics on their resume uh, would help you more likely than not hire a more diverse workforce. And then being conscious of likability ratings. This goes back to what I was saying. Of course, oftentimes we like people who are more um, interested in things we're interested in or maybe look similar to us or have a similar background to us. So it, I'm not saying you should hire somebody that you don't like. You have to work with, you have to be able to work with people. So, but keep that in mind as one criteria. Essentially, you can have five different sets of criteria or three different sets of criteria and likability can be one of them, but make sure you're weighting it appropriately. So you just like this person in your gut and you're giving them a 10 out of 10, but actually on the work test, they did a six out of 10. Have a, have a math equation already prepared that says that the actual work quality is gonna be rated more strongly than the likability. Um, retaining diverse talent, this is where I see people screw up the most, uh, and I'm talking about my clients and even probably uh, myself in some ways. So how do you retain diverse talent? I think you really have to make a conscious effort to listen to people. How do they feel included or where do they feel excluded? I've had some clients do this thing called hosting listening sessions. It's, it has to be in a smaller group. So it's either a team or a company that's a smaller company. And you sit around together and the leader or the supervisor asks some questions that are really asking for candid feedback. 
and then just listens and prods for more information, you know, gives people, oh, tell me more about that, tell me more about that, but does not react to anything. And people have found out, uh, for example, one client found out that some of the women on the team did not like that the CEO, when he came in the office, used the phrase, hey guys, they thought it was um, genderizing and that it was exclusionary for the women. And the fact is, I mean, does it really make that, you know, he felt sensitive about it. And I can understand that when we, when you hear that your behavior has a negative effect on somebody, it can, we can all get kind of defensive about it, but does it really hurt you to start coming in and just saying, hi everyone, or hey, and not say anything more? Um, not really. It just, you got to get over that initial kind of eh feeling when somebody insults you and and you didn't intend it that way. So hosting listening sessions, I think are, is a good way of helping people feel like I'm being heard and I want to stick around. Um, conducting focus groups. So this is usually in a larger organization. I think it's good to have somebody external reach out to members of a team if you see a team struggling and asking them for their candid feedback. People, when they're asked the right questions, will tell you so much information. Um, I don't think that employees honestly answer those kind of checkbox surveys, but I do believe that people will honestly answer the questions because for anybody who's on here who's a litigator, it's like when you start deposing somebody and then people just start talking because they kind of forget to be on guard and the conversation gets comfortable and they start revealing that, oh, maybe this manager is too harsh or maybe this manager is exhibiting some biases against certain team members. <coughs> uh, so having those kinds of focus group conversations, I think is a way to figure out where you're messing up and then actually addressing it. Part of the retaining talent here though, I think is um, telling people, hey, we're gonna conduct this focus group. We really want honest feedback and this is what we're gonna do with it. And then again, to retain people and have credibility, then you really have to follow up and do what you said you were gonna do. So if you say, we're gonna listen to people, we're gonna find out where we need to improve our processes or our policies, then once you get the information, you need to report back to the team members and say, this is what we found and this is what we're doing with it. Uh, Make sure that your team is recognizing diverse holidays and days of remembrance. It gets, uh, you know, we live in a very, um, um, well, a society that really like honors Christmas and Easter or, um, you know, Labor Day or uh, Columbus Day, things like that, where sometimes those can be extremely exclusionary holidays. Uh, find a way to maybe either rotate holidays that you're recognizing or uh, let people choose the holidays that they're recognizing. Find a way to really include everybody on your team, but not just everybody on your team. Think broader. Think who do you serve as a customer? Who are your customers? Who are, who are the people that you're engaging with? And try and be inclusive to all of those people. Um, and then all of this goes to me towards creating an inclusive workplace culture, which is our next step. Um, what determines your company culture? You know, a lot of times you ask people, oh, what's your culture like? Especially if the, you're asking the business owner. I hear so many people say, oh, we have such a great culture. But if you really start asking them more questions about, well, what is your culture? Do they know? Are they truly aware? Oftentimes I find that people are not truly aware. So your company's culture is made up of its processes, its policies, the type of in, uh, communication that uh, people engage in within the company, whether employees feel supported. One thing I think is a big uh, revealing factor in a company's culture is do people gossip? Generally, I find that those are not good cultures. If you have team members gossiping about each other, especially if a leader is, an, is engaging in gossipy, gossiping, 
uh, that promotes this like culture of secrecy. And oftentimes you can see in the documents that those companies use how they view employees, how employees view each other, and it it's usually not very good. So I'm always thinking about well, how does if we're creating a document for our client, how does this reflect on our client? Like, do we seem distrusting? You know, if we have overly broad restrictive covenants, um, and I'm talking about from the standpoint of creating these documents for clients, or in the employee handbook, does it is it thoughtful? Does it truly reflect what what policies are being enforced in the organization? Um, you know, as much as possible, you want to have an intentional culture. So going through each of these bullet points and saying to yourself, what, which of these applies in my organization? How are they applied? And is that really the culture I want to reflect? So do I have employee handbook that promotes an open culture that promotes a lot of communication that's very transparent about what benefits people have? or not. Um, the types of communication, how do people communicate? Do you use Slack? Do you use email? Do people actually have phone conversations? Do you like to speak face to face? All of that goes to your culture because if you have a culture where there's never any face to face communication, uh, you know, I, I question really, and maybe it's because of my age, but I question, is it really an inclusive culture if you're only communicating uh, via like text or Slack or email? So thinking those through, and there's not one right answer. It's more about, well, what kind of culture do you want to have? And is it intentional? The more intentional it is, the more likely employees will feel included in that culture. Unless it's <laughs> intentionally bad, which hopefully is not the case. Um, and then how can you use your like policies and reinforce a healthy, uh, healthy company culture in our trainings, we talk a lot about the policies and how they reflect your values and your, your mission statement and how all of it, it really works together to create one coherent picture. I think of your culture, much like your family's culture. I mean, there's expectations. Is there an expectation for high quality work? Is there expectation for treating everybody with respect? Is there an expectation um, that everybody puts in their best effort and then also calls each other out when they're falling behind and helps each other out when they're falling behind? Um, you know, I think all of these things can play a big factor in reinforcing the healthy culture. The opposite end is, we don't have any clear policies. We randomly apply things, you know, um, and I know when I first started the firm and first started hiring people, it was like reviews were haphazard, raises were just based on, um, I don't know, no true process really. And I remember um, one employee, I was giving her her end of year review and I was giving her her bonus. And I was really excited because I thought it was a lot of money. And at the end, she was extremely disappointed. And I realized I didn't have a process. And also I hadn't checked the prior year's numbers. And essentially I was reducing her bonus eligibility because I didn't have any clear, transparent process for how all of this was done. And I was just randomly, haphazardly um, giving people what I thought, oh, okay, they're going to be happy with this. So as much as you can have processes for all of this, I would say, and then this helps you be consistent. It helps you make sure that your values are really being applied and lived and understood by all employees. And then the training employees, I, I mean, I gotta say, I'm so bad at training because I'm just not naturally a patient person but I know how important that is. And so I also try and work with my team members to make sure that there's training available, even if I'm not always the one to give it. So understanding your own weaknesses, I think is really important part of creating uh, and reinforcing a healthy company culture. So the detractors, no training, uh, lack of communication, 
Retaliation, retaliation is so subtle. I mean, we litigate a lot and it's a lot easier to win retaliation claims because there's kind of a general feeling in the public that um, most people have to deal with some level of discrimination. And so I think that sometimes in the in litigation, there's like a suck it up, you know, we all have to deal with it feeling, but people don't like retaliation. And we see it all the time and it's oftentimes subtle, but you don't like somebody because they challenged you and you might not think of it as retaliation, but you know, just subtle things like, oh, I'm not gonna promote that person. I'm not gonna give them the good work. I'm not giving them the good projects anymore. Um, also having policies that are only focused on limiting liability, I think is a big culture just detractor. People. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about like authenticity, which I think is a little bit overused, but at the same time, it is important to be authentic. If people don't believe you actually care about them or you actually have these policies to benefit them as well as you, then there's not going to be a, you're just not going to have a good relationship. It's just like any dating relationship or marriage where if you don't have mutual trust, it's kind of dead on arrival. Um, no cultural buy-in from top leadership. I, I see a lot of times people offsetting um, people who are maybe at the CEO or COO level saying, okay, well, HR is responsible for setting the culture and making sure we have the right policies. Culture is top down. You have to, again, it goes back to just your family. Like who sets the culture in a family? It's usually the parents that do that. And then it's spread throughout the family. Um, in team meetings, I say apply the Socratic method to team discussions. And by this, I mean, not trying to embarrass people or call them out about not knowing an answer, but more calling on people so that they can be engaged in a conversation, asking them their opinion. So I, you know, maybe it's the wrong terminology here a little bit because I'm, I'm truly not saying call on somebody for the right answer, but call on somebody to get their opinion uh, because some people are less likely to speak up. And, you know, we all maybe sometimes I'm sure I could be that person who like sucks the air out of the room because I'm always talking. Um, you want to make sure that you're giving the opportunity to all team members to be heard because otherwise you're going to let the, you know, the loudest voices kind of direct the culture. Rotate meeting participants, meaning have a small group that they're presenting on this particular topic, whether it's a project that you're working on or a project that they're working on or just something that you're exploring. Assign different people and have different team members lead meetings at different times. Uh, I say this all the time, this whole thing about policies, but make sure that the policies actually fit the culture that you're creating. Um, and use a handbook or a culture manual. Uh, an employee handbook does not have to be, you know, a hundred or 200 or 300 page document. An employee handbook can be a five page document, a two page document. It could be literally a one page document that just says that these are our guiding principles in terms of how we behave towards each other. Usually, I, it probably should be a little bit longer because once you have a handbook, you should have certain things that are more legally required as well, but it doesn't have to be long. It really has to be a true reflection of the policies you're going to actually enforce. And foster open communication. Part of this is uh, being vulnerable, being willing to take criticism from your team members, uh, giving people an opportunity to, speak up and say when they're overwhelmed or they don't know an answer and making sure that they know that they'll be supportive that it's not knowing the answer it's being part of the team that's the most critical so starting an initiative um you know real quick oh, yeah. um kristen mm -hmm. dana can I, I um, 
Yeah, can I stop you right there since that was at a transition? I yeah. wanted to just ask you a couple questions about maybe some great examples that you have seen or come across um, about all of the things that you just talked about, because I think it's one thing to see um, tips and instructions and things for you to think about, but then I think it's also really helpful to kind of hear anecdotes and, and maybe experiences that you have had that you say, you know, this one time I saw this happen and it really worked well, et cetera. Could you share some of that? Yeah, I have a lot of uh, stories on what hasn't worked well, and I have a couple stories on what has worked well. Um, one thing that I think has worked well, even in a small company, we did like a culture audit recently for an employee where we called every employee that was on this particular team and got feedback about how the company operates. And uh, we did it because there was actually a um, an anonymous report about some negative behaviors. And it was interesting because the employer was really nervous about this tip. And what we found was that most of the employees actually did feel really engaged. And that the people that felt unengaged were the people who didn't like, you know, the company did a lot of like those birthday celebrations or get togethers where people engage. And some people don't like that for social hour. So the company was able to use that feedback and change some of the things. So yes, they still did that stuff. They weren't going to stop because a lot of employees really like the social aspect of it all. But then also accounting for these people who set, who are more introverted and didn't want to be part of that, getting them involved and getting them heard and actually asking them, well, what else could we do? And some of the things were more just, Oh, in meetings, can we have quicker meetings? Can we have um, can we have less people invited to talk in meetings? And so, actually adapting a little bit and using both the okay in these meetings, everybody's going to have a chance to talk. But then in these meetings, we're just focused on this one project. We're going to do it for, with 15 minutes. It'll be quick, and we're not going to have everybody put in their opinion. You know, everybody state their opinion. I think it's great because then the people who don't necessarily love the social stuff still feel heard and they'll be more forgiving about okay fine i'll participate in your you know cheesy birthday party celebration as long as you're also being respectful of my time in this situation so i, I find that that's really helpful what i find doesn't work is um, a lot of with like black lives matter a lot of companies came out with statements and i um had HR departments calling me and saying, listen, our employees are really pissed because we came out with this statement and it's a strong, like, we support Black Lives Matter, we're committed to diversity statement, and people don't think that we're really doing anything about it. Um, one company I know even gave a big amount of money to, um, to some nonprofits that were supporting Black Lives Matter and the employees were still feeling like this is totally empty. You're not actually following through. There's a lack of authenticity. So I say, ask people. I mean, it's kind of the most basic thing, but actually asking employees, I think you'll get honest answers because these employees- well, I think that, that works easier if you have a group. Right, but let's talk about um, people like myself that has a really small staff. So it's not as comfortable, maybe. You know, employees might feel um, comfortable telling me how they feel, and I can't do anything anonymous because there's only three people, you know, in the office. Um, so. From the stand, from a smaller standpoint, where there is no such thing as HR, you know, and we're trying to um, make a more inclusive workplace. Um, do you have any guidance from that standpoint? Well, I have my personal experience that um, early on, and I had a very small team. I did. Um, some leadership training where they do a 360 
And they don't just ask the people that work for you. They ask people that you've worked with in the past. Uh, they'll ask family members. So it's a wider, they cast this wider net that really where people can give more honest feedback because it truly is anonymous. And I will say it was, it's painful because not seeing, I think a lot of times we might know some of our own bad behaviors, but maybe we don't realize how they impact people. And so I know for me, getting that 360 from this like wider group of people who either I've worked with in the past, who worked for me currently, again, who are family members even, it, it was really painful, but it was also very powerful. And I feel like afterwards, everybody on my team knew that I really took it to heart and tried to make conscious changes. So I would recommend something like that if you can do that. It is a financial investment, but even, you know, even if it's a more simple, like having a meeting specifically for that with the small group where you just say, I just want us to talk as open and honestly about how we can create together a more inclusive culture. I think a lot of times you will get feedback. Um, sometimes we don't ask the questions because we assume people won't give us the honest answer. But I think that's more of a fear based, like we just don't want to hear the honest answer. And so it's easier to not ask the question. So I would say even mm -hmm. in a small group, ask the question, because even if they're lying, at least you're making that true authentic effort to say, please, you know, tell me where am I failing here? Or how, how could I do better? You know? So I would still say ask. I mean, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hearing like, Basically, even if you don't have a large company that you're running with a lot of employees um, to buffer out maybe employees concerns, I hear you saying kind of look to your network, whether that includes your colleagues, um, your clients, your friends, your family, and try to gather feedback to really touch on you know, am I projecting all, all of the things I'm hoping to project, right? Yeah. I mean, and I love the fact that you said asking. I'm going to get you back into where you left off. Um, well, I but thanks for that touching on those questions. If you have siblings, they probably will be honest. I mean, I, my older sister is looking for a job and I offered to uh, look at her resume and she told me no, because she told me I'm too scary. So I, you know, I feel like she'll say things that probably my team members wouldn't tell me. <laughs> it, it will make me look at my own behaviors, you know? Um, yeah. So some other things that you can do if you are hiring, if you're deciding, okay, well, I am going to hire and I want to make sure I'm not hiring someone who just looks just like me or has the same background as me, you can um, use tools that are out there. There Some are free, some you have to pay for, but honestly, if you Google like tools for hiring, um, blind hiring, there's a bunch of tools. And this tool called Alex, this is more about like, what's your job description? Are you using gendered language? Because I say, hey guys, all the time. And I never thought of that as gendered language until a client was telling me, that their employees don't like being called guys. Or also that this person, this uh, one company I can think of had the same employees for like five years and never knew that one of the employees is gender fluid and wants to be referred to as they. I, and you know, that's to work with somebody for five years and not know like, their gender identity is a little bit, it's interesting. It shows that maybe people weren't feeling completely comfortable until they were asked to speak up. Um, have everybody on the team take an implicit association test. So I think it's hard when you see your own biases, but if your whole team is doing it and you can openly have a discussion about your biases, you'll find some interesting uh, results and you'll find generally I mean, most of the data shows that women have the same biases against women that men do, or um, you know, people of color have the same biases against people of color, or um, you know, just you will be shocked 
that it is not like, oh, well, you're this bad person because you have biases. You'll find that everybody on your team has some sort of implicit bias. Um, review marketing images and language. So I don't know if anybody remembers this, but a couple of years ago, um, the Red Cross had this um, sw like water safety poster and it ended up all over social media. It had been their same poster for I think like 20 years and nobody ever noticed the fact that essentially all the like white stick figures were the swimmers and all the colored, like all the whatever red or you know non-white stick figures were like the doing the wrong thing. They had crosses over them and like, you're breaking the rules, you don't know how to swim. And it became this like huge marketing issue for them because essentially people were saying, okay, this is, you know, racial, racial stereotypes that you put out there. And it was because nobody's really taking a look at these things and saying, is this really who we are and the message that we want out there? And it wasn't until, like I said, somebody randomly, I think was at like a YWCA pool or something and saw the Red Cross poster and took a picture and put it on social media and it just got blasted. So things like that were, you know, look at your website. My husband sent me his um, company website a couple years ago and I was like, it's all white men. <laughs> what? I'm like, are these the marketing images you guys want to put out there? So kind of being aware of what you're putting out there and is that really what you want to be putting out there? Um, hold on. Oh, I'm like, I went, I went through this quickly. So the hosting listening sessions is one of my favorites. This is where I think that you get the most honest feedback where you sit down and, and can ask the questions and get the, get the answers that you don't want to hear. Uh, How often do you recommend having those? Even if you just have your one secretary, you know, your partner. Oh, it's even more important. I think if you just have one person that you work with, that you sit down on a quarterly basis and have an intentional conversation about this. It doesn't have to be monthly, but I think quarterly, it should be not annually. It's kind of like when people say annual reviews are outdated now. It should be the quarterly review where you're not just reviewing that person, but you're getting the review about how are we communicating? What are we putting out there? Is there like what, what kind of, I know in my office, like we do a lot of blog posts or article writing. What, what are we putting out there and what type of language are we using in what we're putting out there? Um, some of it can be using, I would say like games or tools. There are actually these um, conversation starters that you can buy. There's like a box of questions that are that are challenging questions about people's uh, about people's view of like diversity or your view of different cultures that promote honest conversations. And I think I've generally found people are a lot more forgiving of negative biases if you're honest about them and they can be challenged. So if you are trying to hide your opinion because you think somebody might not like your opinion, people are gonna know. You know that saying bees and dogs smell fear? I always think employees or team members, the people that you're around, they can tell if you don't like them, they could tell if you have like some negative biases that you're trying to hide and you're trying to cover things up there's like a subtle energy that you put out there that can be really off putting for people. So uh, being mindful of that. And then also using the policies to promote conversation. So if you have like a team of one or two people and you have like a three page policy manual, it's what a great opportunity to sit around and talk about this and say, hey, are these, are we really living these out? Is this how we actually handle problems in our organization? Do we need to update this? Is this, um, is this a true reflection of our working style or is this more aspirational? And if it's aspirational, it's fine, but at least be honest with yourself because I think people end up leaving organizations because they think, okay, we say all this stuff, 
we make all these promises to each other, but we don't follow through on them. So making sure that you're actually really um, living the things that you put in writing and that you say that you're trying to, or at least like making strides towards that. So if you're saying, hey, we are an inclusive organization and we serve people from every background, then make sure that you're really reaching out to people of every background. You know, if you're, uh, if you say that, okay, I, I help people, like in my office, we try to, we have a certain like target client base, which is executives, professionals, and business owners. But at the same time, we also want to say that we help all employees. And so we make sure that we're targeting that the group of people that we can just be helping as well, whether it's for pro bono or uh, more just like a passion project. So having that true idea of like who you are, who you're talking to, and how you can expand on that, I think is very important. Um, and then, has, I don't know if you've ever done this, Dana, but have you ever taken like a working styles test? No, I have. I didn't even realize there was one. Yeah, so there's these tests out there that say, like for example, I'm probably the hardest person to work with because I am very much like strategy thinking, not linear, you know, A to Z, let's just get there kind of thinking. And most people generally want to have like a roadmap of how to do things. And I think, uh, so I've taken that test and figured out that I am probably one of the most challenging people to work for because I am not good at breaking things down into this like step by step by step approach. Um, but then at the same so time, so working styles test is going to tell you things like, like you are, you know, conducive to working with a group. Yeah, it will tell you or you're not conducive. Like you need to do, you need to be focused on projects that are solo projects and, you know, with minimal interaction from people or minimal direction. And it's good because I think if people know that about you, then they're they're willing to adapt their style a little. They want you to adapt as well. Like you have to be able to work outside your own working style a little bit as well. But generally speaking, I think people will be more forgiving if they're aware, oh, this is just her working style. She's not just being rude to me or she's not, it's not that she doesn't want my opinion. It's just, this is how she works best and I'm going to accommodate that for her. Yeah. Well, actually, now that you say that, it seems like um, it brings to mind that a lot of times you get hired somewhere and you're coming into um, one or more people who have some sort of rhythm that they've developed over time. And now you're trying to figure it out. And oftentimes you don't know any of these people. So you need to get to know them kind of quickly professionally. Um, and potentially this kind of understanding the idea of different work styles and not taking things personally, uh, I could see, I could see how that could make a difference, you know, because myself included, it's easy to um, take something personally accidentally. And, you know, you might have a different sensitivity to that. And as an employer, just being cognizant and taking advantage of an opportunity to explain that to your staff could could probably um, help mitigate that risk. Yeah, that is true. Well, and, you know, I heard some great advice. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I, I wanted to just ask you about the, you mentioned um, recognizing holidays. And to me that, I, I'd like to just spend a couple minutes on that because I, I find um, that to be an interesting practice management question. You know, there are so many holidays that everybody shares like, you know, I think everybody takes Labor Day off, for example, you know, like the the holidays that are not really associated to anyone's faith or ethnicity, you know, something that is just we live in America and we recognize it. So those are kind of easy ones because everybody's on the same page. 
But then you have a bunch of holidays that are um, specifically recognized for some other reason. And from a practice management standpoint, uh, do you have any thoughts about how one should handle that? I mean, are you closed on certain holidays? Do you pay your employees for particular holidays? Well, um, is that an opportunity to, you know, support their mental health and well-being? You know, what, what do you have any comments about that? Yeah. So, um, like for example, as a firm, we decided this year that we going forward and this year that we would close on Juneteenth and we would recognize that as um, a holiday for the firm. But then also I think, okay, some people feel might feel like, well, then I'm excluded from my holiday. So I think it's important to say, especially for law, I think we can do this. Some companies, it's a little bit more challenging, like if you're in manufacturing, but in, in law, I like to say, uh, you have a certain number of holidays. There's gonna be certain days that the office is closed, but then let's say you have 10 total holidays and six of them are office is closed and that's it. And everybody takes them and gets paid for them. And four of them are paid, but they're they're up to the employee to choose how they want to rec what they want to recognize. So we're not saying you have to recognize this or you don't have to recognize this. And, you know, it can be more, it can be less, but giving people some input into what did they consider a holiday and how do they want to, uh, how do they want to use that? And I think for larger companies that do manufacturing, you can still do that. And it probably gives you more options to keep operations going on days that not everybody would recognize as a holiday. So that's something that I try to do is say, pick your, pick your holidays. These holidays we recognize, but then pick the holidays that are important to you. Um, now, I don't know, that could still make people feel excluded. I think the important thing is asking them, like, do you feel like you're being heard, you know, that you're being recognized for your unique characteristics or the unique value that your experiences bring to the table. Yeah. There's no one right answer. Again, I mean, I have learned even through my job, sometimes clients tell me about like this history of microaggressions at their firm or at their company. And I can tell because the culmination of everything is so huge. But at the same time, part of me is like, well, oh, that one thing I can understand, like I would miss it too if I was the boss. Like I wouldn't have noticed myself doing that. So, mm -hmm. but I think for those same people who are telling me about these microaggressions, I think if somebody ever asked them, they would have told them. They would have said, I find that it really offends me that you do this. It really offends me that, you know, you, I keep bringing up that example of this, hey guys kind of thing. I think people will, mm -hmm tell you when they're offended if you're asking them but otherwise people just assume you know like in a, it's like when you're younger and your friend tells you they want like their boyfriend or their girlfriend or whoever to just know what they're feeling they don't want to have to tell them mm -hmm. what they're feeling so the best thing you could do is the supervisors ask how people how they're feeling just try oversimplify yeah well that Interestingly, that is exactly what I wound up choosing to do was we have X holidays that the office is closed and then I give everybody four flex oh. holidays. <laughs> so four paid days that they have to um, that they have to choose. Okay, well, I know we are getting close to our one hour up, so I'm just going to let you finish off your slides um, well, and then I'll be back up with just a couple closing remarks. All right, well, I just want to say that the most important thing, we always say this for all of our trainings, is that it's all about your company culture and you are in control of the culture that you create. If anybody has any questions, I know there was nothing in the chat, but if you wanna reach out to me, you're welcome to, um, you know, 
this is our web address. My email is on there. You can call me. I usually try to be as helpful as possible. All right. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, um, I'll just leave that up for a second if people are writing it down. Or, Kristen, if you can also maybe just type it into the chat if, if anybody still needs some of that information, like your email, um, name, and phone number. And I'll take the this next uh, minute just to say thanks for joining us today. Uh, Friendly Lawyers is a social network of attorneys around Chicagoland. We are here to facilitate social engagement so that you can grow your network. And we like to provide educational resources for practice management as well. Um, a warm thank you to Kristen for joining us and giving us this information. It's both important to know, I believe, and I hope helpful. We want to do things that help you succeed. It also helps us get that diversity hour that we need to get for <laughs> Illinois. So a triple win there. Thank you, Kristen.